It's the week ending Saturday the 23rd of February and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days we've seen former IS recruit Shamima Begum losing her British citizenship, 11 MPs resigning from the major political parties to join the newly formed independent group and a tortoise declared extinct over a hundred years ago discovered in Galapagos. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news not making headlines right now but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Molly Mann. Let's unwrap the week. And joining me today from the week's digital team are Jamie Timpson, Rebecca Gilley, and Holly Clements. And Jamie, you are starting the show this week. What do you think this week should be remembered for? This was the week that dire relations between two nations started to affect the life of Haitians. Eight men arrested in Haiti, five of them Americans. Police say they were heavily armed. The country's prime minister now calling them terrorists. These men were mercenaries, he says. They were here to attack part of the executive branch of the government. I promise you we will know every detail of why they were here. CNN's Miguel Marquez reporting this week from Haiti. Jamie, what's happening in Haiti? Well... Funny you should ask. This week... I mean, I'm inclined just to ask you about your rap introduction to the story. Yeah. But it seems too serious for that. Uh, yes. (laughs) So what is happening in Haiti? you're right. I guess you're you're right. Never... And you never let that get in the way of a good joke, though, eh? Haitian police arrested five Americans, one Russian and one Serbian, this week, who were caught driving around the capital, Port-au-Prince, with a, a truck full of guns ammunition, fake license plates, and two satellite phones. And people aren't really sure what they were doing, except that they were five former US military veterans. Smells fishy. Smells fishy, exactly. S- sounds like it has the makings of a classic Jamie Timpson conspiracy. Yes. It, what's your theory? Well, it seems to be at least the, the kind of theory behind it is that the Haitian president, President Moise, He has been under a huge amount of pressure and protests from demonstrators in Haiti since it became clear that money that Venezuela had given to Haiti for improvements and and basically like aid what had been siphoned off and not used to build infrastructure. Since the protests began on the 7th of February, there's been a lot of worry, mainly in America, that the president will be kind of removed. And just coincidentally, recently, the president of Haiti backed for the very first time the American decision to try and remove President Maduro in Venezuela. This all sounds very civilised. I want the conspiracy, Jamie. Uh, What do you think these blokes were doing there? Who do you think paid for them to be there? Basically, it's possible, and I think so. What do you think? Well, so they told told Haitian police that they were on an unnamed government's mission and that their people would ring the Haitian police's people to free them. Why do you think they were there? They were there to to stop the protests, to start shooting at anti-government or uh, anti-government protesters in order to keep the presidential puppet of America in power. Or yes, the other take on the situation potentially. I'm not necessarily saying this is true, but so these guys were driving around in two cars. One of the cars was registered to an advisor to the president, but the prime minister has now said these mercenaries were there to attack part of the executive branch, which would be the president. So it sounds like the government is trying to spin this to say this was maybe potentially like a foreign attempt, a coup to remove the president. But then, of course, that could then be their cover up for the fact that they were actually there on behalf of the Haitian government to suppress the protests. In any case, they don't seem very efficient at what they were trying to do, do they, Holly? Because they got caught and then it's in the international media and here we are talking about it. It's not that covert. Yeah, and if they were going around shooting people in a protest, I feel like there might be evidence of that. They didn't have the licence plates on. Surely you just have fake licence plates. Like when I'm a mercenary, I would put a fake licence on. <laughs> you wouldn't just have no licence. That's really dodgy. I would stop anyone without a oh, licence plate. Here's another layer of the conspiracy. Right. I've seen some analysts on Twitter speculating that this was a deliberate display by the US to show them how easily they could infiltrate Haiti and how they could interfere with Haitian politics if they don't go the way they want, so that this was kind of a staged demonstration. Indeed, that that just, sounds like the kind of thing that would appeal to you, Jamie. Yeah, indeed. Is that, is that what you just, weren't, weren't prepared to say? Uh, yes, I mean, I, the these thing Trump's is, men, is that is your I've, belief. in the past, on this podcast, I have said things that have since been cut yeah. Be- and and I would like uh, I would just like to put on record that I've been censored yeah. because of some of my beliefs. I mean, and I've, I've had grown... people text me saying I can't believe what Jamie Timpson just said, and that's the stuff we broadcast. Yeah, can you imagine? Can you imagine what I say off air? 
and so and so I wasn't willing to go that far because obviously I've learned and I've grown as a person to not <laughs> or obviously whatever you guys want to want me to say I'll say fine but on Thursday the five former US military vets that were in the car were taken back to the US and obviously it's yet to, to be seen what will happen to them taken um, ta- they were they were flown back basically they to were, they were supposed to appear in court in Haiti but instead they were whisked back to the US which does add to the theory mm. that the American government were b- behind it. But that's a simple journalistic question, isn't it? Who did the whisking? <laughs> who whisked? <laughs> who, who let them be whisked yeah. is perhaps the question. <laughs> well, they've got, I mean, they have got, obviously, the, the Haitian president has obviously got good relations with the American in- administration at the moment, mainly because of this desire for protection. I mean, Haiti is a, is a state that has gone through immense amounts of poverty, even since 2010 with the earthquake. But, you know, since then, they still have temporary protected status, which means that Haitians can get easy travel into um, the United States. They were also, if everyone can remember, the country described as a shithole by the current president, Donald Trump. And I mean, that's that's the background to this story and all stories about Haiti, isn't it? You know, the, the earthquake in particular from nine years ago that pretty much destroyed it and its relations with the U.S., that's kind of informing everything that's coming out of that country. I think corruption's also a big part of it. Poverty's terrible for the people there. There are obviously 200,000 people killed in the earthquake and people are still haven't got homes. I think it's the poorest country in America and one of the most corrupt in the world. Forbes describes it, sums it up. After its independence in the early 1800s, its first emperor was shot and hacked to pieces by citizens angry over rampant corruption. Little has changed since then, <laughs> which is quite a damning verdict on the corruption of the country. So... Who knows who whisked them away? It could have been anyone within that government. The trust in their politicians. I think people are completely disillusioned with their politicians. And, I mean, this hasn't been much reported, has it? Is that an oversight or is this, you know, a pretty minor story that tells us things that we probably already suspected? I think it adds to... Well, from I think from my perspective, it adds to this um, kind of a growing mosaic that we're starting to get of exactly how many mercenary groups are operating around the world and that they do still play... A, you know, you, you kind of think about it as like, oh, you know, something that the CIA used to do in South America, but how large role mercenaries still play all around the world. There was actually a really excellent episode of the podcast Reply All recently where they talked about this. This guy who started as a tech guy eventually became kind of an international drug lord and ha- he had these mercenaries working for him around the world going to places like Somalia, uh, you know, selling gold and trading it for drugs and stuff. And th- there is this huge underground network of people around the world working in this. And I suppose it would be naive, Jamie, as well, to suppose that we don't have British mercenaries doing similar things. No, are you talking about... <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that what Cut. you mean? <laughs> um, I think that there obviously is a, a role for mercenaries... I mean, I don't agree with the, the prospect of them, but there is obviously a role in it for, that British governments are well interested in using. I think probably the reason that I think it's worth reporting is that it's a, another example of the way that the US is using its kind of soft power, or indeed hard power, if you look at the guys with the guns, but so, you know, soft power to influence people's kind of viewpoints on Venezuela. You know, they are so close to removing Maduro from power and putting and if they can get other countries on side which they have de- they have definitely lent on Haiti in order to get their support and if they can get in the region, you know, Haiti was a big ally of um of Chavez originally. And so I think this is a an, an apt example of the way that the US are now using their, you know, soft power to try and turn the world against Maduro. And also, I suppose, a demonstration of the power of the internet for these kinds of stories to circulate and recirculate. Because, you know, t- 20 years ago, this would have been something that was reported as a footnote in, in our newspapers. And then maybe someone might have picked it up on the TV or the radio broadcast news. But basically, it would be forgotten about. Whereas now, it's the kind of thing that, thanks to blogs and podcasts and Twitter and whatever, actually, you, you can't get away with this kind of stuff. People are going to ask questions. I think the mystery in it probably feeds that as well. If If we knew exactly who they were and what they were doing it might tell a different story. I think internet spawn of conspiracies, we all want to create our own story around it, which makes it interesting in itself. Modicum of truth in every conspiracy, isn't there? Oh. I'll, I'll leave that hanging in the air. <laughs> and uh, Holly, you'll be up next after this. Okay, Holly, your turn. What do you think this week will be remembered for? Are we all barking up the family tree? K 
Callie's only been a member of the Giuliano family for a few weeks, but already Steve and Gail are tired of being asked, what is she? A shepherd and then you know, there's some hound in there probably. They want to know if she'll like the backyard pool, grow as tall as a pony, or be predisposed to health problems. So the family sent off a DNA test. Well, I was hoping for her to be real social, and we've already, we already know that she is. So here are three dogs, and results on each from multiple companies. Brooks is certified by the American Kennel Club as purebred. Wisdom Panel and DNA My Dog both nailed it. 100% whip it. That was Channel 5's Ashley Walters reporting for WPTV in West Palm Beach. Holly, DNA kits for dogs is your story of the week. Yep, it's uh, the most important story of the week. That's right, 11 defected <laughs> MPs, DNA kits for dogs. Uh, <laughs> go, tell us why. So New York's just had its Kennel Club dog show. We're about to have Crofts here. It's emerged that more than a million dogs in the US have had their DNA tested. Um, there's clearly health benefits to it, but I also think it kind of speaks to this rising obsession of humans also testing their own DNA and more people buying over-the-counter kits and wanting to know who they are. Are they buying them as Christmas presents, as birthday presents? It's becoming quite an everyday thing to do. OK, I mean, that is interesting, and let's park that and come back to it. On the dog front... It doesn't seem to me to be a controversial thing to do. I've, I'm not a dog guy. I'm a cat guy. I've never owned a dog. But my friends who have dogs do seem to get asked the question, what is it, a lot. And you want to know. You don't just want to say, oh, it's a mongrel, oh, it's a breed of this and this. I understand why people would like to know what their dog is. It's interesting though, isn't it? But I think you can't uh, you can't help but think about the human side of it as well. Why people want to know? Like, why do you need to know what your dog is? I think maybe because someone it's the that... first question people ask. Yeah, but like, like they don't about your child. They don't say what proportion Ashkenazi <laughs> Jew is in there, <laughs> whereas they do say with a dog. I guess is it a pit bull you... cross? <laughs> maybe someone that owns a pedigree dog might think differently to someone that owns a rescue dog that doesn't There's care. There's big problems as well. There's big problems with it. Uh, like, So there was an interview in a science magazine with a leading vet that was talking about dog DNA tests and saying that actually people are using it to look at like maybe degenerative diseases or some kind of illness that the dog may have genetically. And they are sometimes, in some cases, asking to put to, to preemptively ask to end the dog's life because of the disease that they may or may not have like, has occurred in them but could happen in the future. And she's saying that the problem is is that with human disorders and, and like that thing, the science has caught up with humans, so they're able to say that, well, this percentage of people will not get this disease. But once you have the DNA behind a, a dog's health, there isn't actually a lot of science or kind of medical research or studying behind what will happen to that dog in later life with that disease. So actually it's causing a big minefield for vets if you come in with a dog DNA thing saying, oh, but I'm really worried that it's going to get asthma. I don't I, know. I, I suppose the crossover there with humans in an American context is that obviously with pets, you have health insurance like we do here in Europe, but they have that for their general health needs too. So there is more of a parallel true, there. Right? Yeah, I guess life insurance and things it would feed into if everyone had to have DNA tests. Well, or if there's if those an established system for dogs. Yeah, well, and there is a plus side to what Jamie's saying in that dog breeders are not breeding two dogs that might have inherited diseases. So there's been a big decrease in dogs that are born with things like blindness. There's conditions that you can kind of breed out without euthanizing any dogs. And also some of the services, some of the more high-end ones, they can give the owners advice on how to basically, like how to raise their dogs based on their DNA. And so, you know, you might not know it's, you know, it has a small percentage of this breed that needs this kind of care. You know, it can help you decide like how much you should be feeding the dog, exercising the dog, what have you. But I think most of it's just fun. I was looking at some of them and they, you know, they you take basically dog personality quizzes. The point being that they chart those responses and then they can kind of come up with like general things for that breed if they have enough responses. Like ask you questions like how much does your dog fart? What does it sound like when it barks? And then they kind of build a profile of that kind of dog. Or say the really high-end ones can make a kind of family tree. They can match your dog to dogs it shares DNA with so that it can find like some long-lost cousins, etc. I mean, I'm not an animal person, so I, I don't know if you can tell, but obviously this does all seem slightly ridiculous to me. But, and not to put too fine a point on it, but I do think it speaks to our need to categorise things. Because as you were saying earlier, Ollie, like people like to know what they're dog's breed is sure but there was a time when people would just say it's a mutt or it's a mix or we think it's blah and blah but now I, I again I don't want to like overstretch the comparison but we do like to put labels on ourselves more and more and, and so it's a hashtag dogs as well. for the Instagram age you know so then you can be like oh it's hashtag 
a poodle, half poodle, and then it's just something that the picture can go under a new tag and we can all just be happy with ourselves. <laughs> we heard there in the report some scepticism about the accuracy of the test being used. That's the case with human DNA tests too, isn't it? And yet a lot of stock is put in those. Yeah, there's a big range. And I think with the dog ones, there's a range of quality as well. There's one the BBC sent off a cat DNA and that came back as a dog. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of goes to show um, the big range of products out there. But also within each product, they use different algorithms because they've got a different database of DNA that exists, which kind of gives rise to a bias in that... In normal research of family trees, you might struggle if you come from a poorer country where there's less of a paper trail. Mm. And similarly, it's America and Europe where people are doing these DNA tests, so it's feeding back into their database. So you've got a predominantly white database, so you might struggle, say, there's somewhere, there's no one from Ghana on their list, so they might just class you as Nigerian. Mm. And for some, some people, that's hugely important. There's a woman in The Guardian that looked herself a Georgina Lawton she wasn't sure from her father's heritage who her father was and she found out she was Nigerian but she didn't know that so from her experience she was saying should I now start claiming Nigeria as my own she might have even been told the wrong country but to suddenly start thinking that's your identity is so confusing and these tests are very easy to do aren't they you basically essentially spit onto a bit of paper and send it off in the post and you get your answer back about potentially yeah like you say who your father is yeah and there's loads of horror stories about you know, people not realising that they were adopted and like those kind of things. Although why anyone in your family, if you did know that they were adopted and you would let them take a DNA test without telling them first, oh, by the way, you're adopted. Drama. I don't know. But there's a, there's a bit of an issue in the doggy dog world that I think could be a bit of a warning for uh, human, for the future of, of human DNA testing is that in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, in a housing estate, they've got all dog owners to DNA test their dogs so that they have a database of all of the dogs on record. And when a dog poos in the estate they then track that using the database they track it and fine and go to the dog owner and say you can't do it and it's reduced poo in the area by up to 75 percent i think over the course of the database but it's wrong and it's bad because at first they came for the dogs and we said nothing <laughs> They'll start doing it for humans. But actually, that's the same as fingerprint technology, isn't it? Yeah, and it's wrong. We shouldn't have it's an idea. We shouldn't have a database. I mean, in law enforcement, is we shouldn't have a database of DNA. That should not be a thing that exists in the UK. You need to just start going to the toilet in your house. But, but hold it, you saying that the police, bearing in mind how important DNA is now in solving all kinds of cases, mm. the police shouldn't hold the DNA of previous criminals? No, no, because it's not that. Because what they're doing is they're taking they're the DNA of everyone. Right. And that but is not, that's know, not okay. Saying, okay. But you did just say we shouldn't have a DNA database. So you're saying we should have a DNA database. Of criminals. Right. Yeah, I'm and criminal that, dogs. But I'm not saying a, D a DNA... I'm not taking DNA from every human and then matching crimes up but to... We've discussed this before on the podcast, don't we? So, Holly, 10 years' time, where do you see this going? Well, potentially everyone will know all the ins and outs of their DNA. As Jamie says, that's quite a scary prospect that private companies are going to hold that much information on you. But if you're voluntarily giving it up, that might be your own choice. And, and it will cross-reference with all the other information we're voluntarily giving up about ourselves every time we do a, a Google search. Yeah, that's how they caught Joseph D'Angelo, the suspected Golden State killer, is that his one of it, like a distant cousin had taken a DNA test which partially matched DNA that they'd recovered from the crime scene. So that could actually be the future. We don't even need the criminal's DNA. We just need a distant relative's DNA on some database. Actually, what if you've done a DNA test on your dog? Then you break into someone's house with your dog, yeah. and your dog <laughs> leaves DNA samples. Yeah, I knew, I knew it would be the dog that gave me away. There we go. <laughs> we brought it full circle. Well, believe it or not, we haven't got to the silly final story yet. That's coming up next after this. And so finally this week, it is Rebecca. What do you think this week's going to be remembered for? Imagine a world without Jar Jar Binks. Where are the others? Eat me! Ah. I've tried to be fair to you creatures. But my patience has reached its end. Now tell me, or I'll... No, not the buttons. Not my gumdrop buttons. All right, then. Who's hiding them? Okay, I'll tell you. Do you know the Muffin Man? The Muffin Man? The Muffin Man. Yes, I know the Muffin Man. 
That was, uh, actually, I really don't know what that was. <laughs> Rebecca, what was that? Um, that was a shot, but you can't see it, unfortunately, because we're listening to it, but that's a shot-for-shot shot remake of the film Shrek. It was done by over 200 animators working in their own styles, and basically they sort of patched the film together, scene by scene, using all different animation styles, even some live action sequences with people dressed up as Shrek. It was basically this project to just remake the whole film in a host of different styles. Okay, so it's kind of internet movie tribute, basically. Yeah. Okay, and this relates to your story of the week, how? So, my story of the week is a Kickstarter campaign that's been launched by um, the director, Adam Sachs, to digitally erase a rat from the final scene of the Martin Scorsese film, The Departed. So, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, the end of the film, basically, they have all turned on each other and ratted one another out. Uh They all meet a a gruesome death, sorry, spoilers again, and the final shot... It's a Scorsese picture, I think we can assume. They all meet a gruesome death. And the final shot of the film is a rat scurrying along a rail leading you to conclude, oh, they're rats, just like that rat, and this is what happens to rats. Because symbolism. Yes. And so Adam Sachs is one of many viewers of the film who has thought, this is a really horrible way to end an otherwise great film. Very on the nose, very dis- very discordant with the rest of the film. So what he wants to do is digitally erase it. Now, you can actually do this quite easily, as you might imagine, with modern technology. But what- By pressing stop when you're watching the DVD. <laughs> but what- <laughs> Be the way to do it. <laughs> he- someone's actually already done it on Twitter. But what he wants to do is raise $4,000, which he did in like 24 hours or something ridiculous, to print the new version of the film, the corrected version of the film, if you will, onto 35mm film and then potentially burn it onto Blu-ray so that fans can enjoy this version in their own home. Okay, so the story is kind of like, we've had the director's cut, mm-hmm. you know, when a director disagrees with how a studio has released their movie. Yeah. This would be now a sort of audience cut this would be the trend. Yeah, and I, I think there's kind of two main points that we can kind of go into on this. One is the democratisation of the media that we, has been brought around by the internet. Like, nothing is really owned as a final product by its creator anymore because it can be remade and remixed online. And, you know, I don't know how Martin Scorsese feels about this, but I imagine not great. And then the other point that I think is interesting about it is how far this technology can go and how and the ways it can be used. And is it right or wrong? One brief example is that when Grease was re-released as kind of a sing-along karaoke version in 2010, they digitally erased the cigarettes from Danny and Sandy's mouths in some key cigarette smoking scenes. Mm. Is it justified? Or is it even, could it even be a good thing to do that? Hard to sing when you've got a cigarette in your mouth, though, I imagine. Well, they just stood there with their lips slightly parted, looking a bit stupid. But the point is, it's set in the 50s. I mean, let's not go down a rabbit hole here, because Greece is obviously not the most realistic depiction of life in the 50s, but in the 50s, people smoked, so... And the cars flew, right? <laughs> <laughs> the point being, I mean, you can take the rat out of The Departed... But if you're choosing to download or stream or buy the version of The Departed without the rat in it, that in itself, your choice to do that, proves the existence of the rat. <laughs> you're, not, it's, it, you're watching the absence of the rat. Oh. So Scorsese's you're still, rat. Yeah, yeah, Scorsese's rat is still there. Now it <laughs> Either is. Either way. Now because DVDs exist and you can hold them in your hand, but maybe one day when we're just a world of YouTube and the only thing that we can see is like clips that the most recently clips that have been yeah, made so that'd be a quirky that's, that's fact, a very interesting because this is the thing about um, streaming music just a little side tangent is that actually Apple so there's been like lots of things about Apple taking back music after people have died and the fact is that when you uh, have Apple music you don't technically own the actual MP3s mm. they own it so they could at any moment change the MP3 to include it wasn't Steve Jobs great and marvellous and you wouldn't know until it came to the end and you wouldn't be able to get the old version so it is like that with films and it's very intangible. If Netflix decided they liked the version of The Departed without the rat and wanted to stream it yeah. that way, you know, you wouldn't know the difference. There's already been, I think we might have talked about it on the podcast before even, about how Netflix was going to trial this way of advertising where they could replace the products in the scene. I think it was in House of Cards. Like, they could be getting a Budweiser out of the fridge, but then when you watched it next time, maybe they're getting a Coke out of the fridge. And it's like, everything is very kind of impermeable now, and I think this is just another example And it dilutes the idea of the directors. Like, it dilutes the whole point of having a release, that like a theatrical release or, or a kind of... The concept of ever-changing art is actually quite a difficult one, I think, for people who have grown up mm. in a world where this is impossible to get their head round. You can't make a judgment call about what's better, but it certainly is different. But I think you can make a judgment call, can't you, that if you value art and the role of artists, that their version is the version for good or ill that was released, and that's the one 
you should refer to and criticise if you don't like elements of it. You know, otherwise, you've always been able to have Lady Chatterley's lover with the sex pages ripped out, haven't you? But that's not the book. I think where does this lead to? Yeah. Maybe I'm speaking my age, <laughs> but surely this isn't OK. But they, like, they've started raising people. Like you could raise Kevin Spacey. That was a director. But Ridley Scott chose to erase Kevin Spacey from all the money in the world. But that was before release. That was before release. So, but I mean, that's a could bit... you do it? Now we've got could this new way of doing it. Could have been in the cinema backwards? with Kevin Spacey <laughs> could and we? then released on DVD could we get rid with of Christopher Blummer? <laughs> but Maybe. And, and they're like, there's a chance that people are more likely to buy your DVD if it doesn't feature Kevin Spacey in it. Mm. Like, really. Or, you know, more likely to, to purchase the film if they erase, you know, in the Stuart Heritage Guardian article, he says taking Kevin Spacey out of Baby Driver. You know, if you did that and then re-released it and said, hey, look, there's this film where we've actually changed the actor. Or... But it's so ridiculous, isn't it? Because where you, we're about to see at some point in the next few months, aren't we, the release of this documentary about Michael Jackson and what he got up to in his personal life. And... That is clearly going to have an impact on how people see Michael Jackson's work. But in Michael Jackson's work, there's lots of clues to what was going on in his personal life. If you take out references to things that, you know, talk about his relationship with drugs or children or sex, you change what the work was in the first place just by making it more palatable. You make it actually less comprehensible, you know, from a human point of view as to who this artist was. I think there's so many connections with, like, in that example, with things like the like stupid debate over Churchill recently, is that actually what I think is best is to look I'm at I'm not our... going to ask Jamie Timpson the hero of a villain question. <laughs> just for you listeners, I'm not going to ask him that question. I mean... No? No, nope, I going. just... <laughs> but from that perspective, you have that feeling of, like, actually all I want is to just view things in, in context and in more context. And if you can provide more context into Michael Jackson's art or if you can provide more context into Kevin Spacey even, then that's a positive and that's something that we should be doing. But exactly. not, not erasing. Exactly. So the cigarettes in Greece are context. Don't they? Set in the I, 50s, made in the 80s, people smoke. Where I think, here, let me give you an example of where I think it gets a bit grey and problematic, though. Is, for instance, okay, if you look back at something like Gone with the Wind, you could say, well, should we cut out all the parts where the slaves are acting really happy to be in slavery? But no, because that is important context because it helps us understand how people were being depicted on screen. Mm. But then we, we were talking about this in the office earlier and podcast contributor Arian McNichol said if he was going to cut something out of a film, he would cut out Mickey Rooney's portrayal of Holly Golightly's Asian landlord in Bref Breakfast at Tiffany's, which I would say is, a, is kind of a different situation because it adds nothing to the film at all and it's grossly racist. And it, but that tells you about what was acceptable in the 1950s and 60s. It's social but it history. Just, but it's exactly. all social history. It's a bit, okay, better example. Mm. I, I give you oh, the, example <laughs> the maid in Tom and Jerry. Now, that's a difficult one because you are showing that to three-year-olds. That was an early example of this yeah. because she was originally a black woman. Yes, who spoke and not just in, any black woman, but like a cliche yeah, stereotype cliche black, black, black housemaid. Yeah. Her original name was Mammy Two-Shoes. Yeah. She was always jumping on stools and shouting, you know, in a very over-the-top racist voice, I'm not going to do it, Jamie, yeah. stop looking at me. <laughs> and then, amusingly, they decided to change it to an Irish stereotype a housekeeper, thinking this is one that's going to last <laughs> yeah. for the ages. And then again, obviously, had to redub it over a third time with yes. kind of a generic voice. Yeah. Which is where we are but now. You see, but that is tricky because I think it's important to remember that that was that for for decades that was how Tom and Jerry was, and the opinion of black people in America wasn't considered important. Mm. But equally, if you're showing it now to a three year old, I'd like my three year old to watch the classic Tom and Jerry. I don't really want the racist stuff in it, so I sort of understand why you. Then they did it with Noddy, didn't they? They changed like white beard, big ears, and all well, Ian Blyton probably needs rewriting, and maybe just don't show your children. I Is don't it know. possible that also, yeah, like maybe it's possible that we just have better children's like programs now, ones that are more. Like yes, it, it's it's important for you to for as like a connection between you and your child, and and like that's why you want him to see them to see Tom and Jerry. Yeah. I mean, I but, actually don't because it's hideously violent, but that's a separate but, issue. But <laughs> actually, maybe we should just say, look, kids, we've got perfectly good children's TV programs, you know, Peppa Pig or or whatever that are able to do, um, <laughs> that you know, that are able to do everything that you want. From... Having this conversation with my son, <laughs> listen, Harvey, I know you want your post-racist, <laughs> yeah, yeah. revisualization. No, but we're going to sit down and watch Tom cartoons. and Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> how would you feel if people mashed up episodes of the week unwrapped to create their own podcast feeds made up entirely of Holden's history lessons I, I would think that would be that. an improvement yeah. frankly mm. yeah. <laughs> that is the challenge yeah. <laughs> but would you feel you, it's that thing isn't it if someone sent something to us where they'd mash this together you'd feel that loss of control wouldn't you as, as an artist if you're going to call yourself that in this context yeah I think Liam Neeson's going to feel kind of like he's lost control and all his films are redubbed with a new character and maybe 
animal <laughs> hospital will come out without Rolf Harris. Like, if you go around raising storylines and people... God, that'd be quite scary if the, if the animal was just hanging in the air <laughs> and Rolf, <laughs> Rolf Harris had gone. <laughs> it was just... <laughs> but they could just use face hell. capture technology and put, like, army hammer over. Uh, yeah, okay. But you could potentially delete someone's whole career, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah. It, it, like, it's, it's totally weird. And But at the same time, I think that the role of the internet in this is that people did not used to go around thinking, oh, I don't like that, I'll take it out. You know, you, mm. people would say, oh, I hate... This is why I mentioned Jar Jar Binks. Jar Jar Binks famously a very hated character in the Star Wars prequels. But people would say he's the worst character ever. I think it's this, you know, it's the current generation of internet savvy users who are saying, well, if I don't like it, I'll just make a version without it. And that- actually, that in context is counterculture, isn't it? You're talking about like it's the mainstream, but actually no one's going to ever think the definitive version of The Departed is the one without the rat. It's counterculture, and we've always had that. It's just the technology allows it to find an expression. I think maybe we might regret those words in 25 years when we're all watching each other's mashed up videos. (laughs) Well, we'll have to return in 25 years. I'm sure we'll still be here each week to discuss. Uh, That is it from this edition. My thanks to Jamie Timpson, Rebecca Gilley and someone else who I've edited out. Um, I just thought they didn't really contribute to the show. Uh, You can find a carefully curated listening experience when you subscribe to our show. Just search for The Week Unwrapped on your podcast app of choice. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Matt Hill at Rethink Audio until we meet again to unwrap next week. Bye-bye.